I want to say thank you <laughs> for this. Some of you may be, uh, oh man, I thought Pastor Dustin was going to teach. And you're like, great. Well, by, by the Lord's sovereignty, by trust in that, I'm here for a reason. God is bringing this passage in Romans chapter 6 here for a reason. And you're here for a reason. And so we're going to trust all that together as God's been a part of that, as, as my support base has been praying for this time. Uh, we were at an event yesterday in Annandale. Uh, we had 40 men show up for a breakfast. We had seven men commit to follow up and to say, I'm committed to getting pornography out of my life. So praise God for that. Uh, we have a growing base of prayer supporters, uh, and we would love for you to join that if you would sign up at the table or any resources. We want to provide families, individuals, women with the resources to get pornography and unwanted sexual sin out of their life. And, uh, and we want to be a resource for churches. And so um, we have some helps back there for whatever category you find yourself in. So I'm going to start uh, with, a, with a question on whether you know what the cobra effect is. How many... Raise your hand if you've heard of the cobra effect. All right, all right, good. Wow, you're the first one. I've ever, yeah, yeah, I've given this message a few times. The cobra effect, uh, it kind of got its origin back in India in the 1800s when Britain was in charge of India, all right? So they had a cobra problem. They had snakes everywhere. So Britain, as governments tend to do, had a solution. <laughs> we will pay you for the skins of cobra. Cobras, great. Well, a bunch of people who are pretty smart in India said, I'm going to raise cobras so that I have many cobras so that I can make some money, right? Super. Well, Britain obviously got wind of this. They're like, well, we can't do this anymore. So they stopped the program. So what do you think all the people on the cobra farms did? <laughs> now they have more cobras than they had before. Another example of this is in Bogota, Colombia, they had a, uh, a pollution problem. So the government, once again, steps in. They say, you know what? You can drive, if your license plate is even, at the end, you drive on these days. If your license plate is an odd number at the end, you drive on these days. Well, people are like, you know what, my job isn't like every other day. <laughs> I need to drive, right? I need to get my kids to school. I need to do... And so you know what they solved the problem with? The people said, I'm just going to buy another vehicle. <laughs> so indeed, the problem became even worse. As with the illustrations, this, is a, this one isn't perfect. But I bring this up because sometimes... God's grace is seen in such a way that we feel like we can maneuver it. Now, truly, God's grace is evident not just in regard to our sin, right? In our everyday life, we see God's grace all over the place, his presence in our life that we don't deserve. Even, even for, for those who aren't believers, there's God's grace abounds, <laughs> right? But this morning, we're going to focus in the area of sin. For the Roman Christians... We're dealing with grace and their sin, and they had it all mixed up. So the situation here the Apostle Paul is addressing in Romans 6, you know, maybe you haven't thought the same way about the grace of God, and maybe not this blatantly, but have you said ever, ever something like this? Hey, God's grace will cover my sin, so I'm good no matter what I do. <laughs> maybe you're in the midst of temptation. And you're like, I just, I, just can't, uh, I just can't help it. But you know what? In the back of your mind, you're like, God will forgive me. See, grace is not just an idea of God's that we as mankind got wind of. <laughs> and we're like, huh, I can sin. God's grace covers me. So really, technically, I could keep sinning. And God's grace abounds more, so... I get what I want, and he looks good for forgiving me. Well, it's a win-win, we think, <laughs> by us sinning. This is where the Romans were at. 
Many times in my 20-year secret struggle, you see, I, I do what I do here because I've had an issue in the past. I had a 20-year secret struggle with pornography. I reasoned in the back of my mind that God was going to forgive me anyway. So that's oftentimes what I gave myself permission to continue to give in. I saw, and we often see grace in that light, don't we, if we're really honest? We think of it as a reward or an incentive, but when our sin rules the day, we lose sight of the fact that God's grace actually defines us, not our sin. And so just our, our main idea this morning is this. God, grace is a gift, a constant presence, meant to eradicate sin, not ignore it. Lord, as we uh, tackle this passage, as we um, get into the midst of um, this conversation, this book uh, that Paul writes to the Roman Christians, Lord, may you... Um, uh, Lord, convict us where we need to be convicted. May you encourage us where we need to be encouraged. May you draw us closer to yourself, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever entered the room in the middle of a conversation? A heated conversation, maybe? I did that recently when um, our two youngest were having an argument and my wife was mediating. So I come in and they're in the middle of this thing. All, you know, all the faces are serious. So I had a choice, right? I could engage, or I could slowly just kind of smile and back away and say, you know what, Becky's got this. I think she's good, you know, she's skilled. Unfortunately, I chose the former. <laughs> Didn't understand all the ins and outs, and so I wanna, uh, we're, in the, we're jumping in the midst of a conversation here. So I'm just gonna briefly, not thoroughly, obviously. Romans chapters 1 through 5 <laughs> are stacked full of awesome stuff, right? But I'm just going to catch us up in the conversation just with a few points. The gospel of Jesus Christ is powerful. The power of God is made manifest in the gospel of Jesus Christ, saved by grace through faith. That's the epitome of power, okay? That's kind of the theme. Paul continues in, in chapter 1, the world is without excuse now because Christ, because of creation, all right? The world is without excuse. Chapter 2, Christians, <laughs> friends, we are without excuse because guess what? Our actions still fall short. Works cannot save, and it's always been about faith. And then finally, God proves this, that we're saved by grace through faith, by meeting each and every sin with his grace that goes above and beyond. So, with the power of the cross in mind, a proof of God's grace, right? The cross is proof of God's grace. The resurrection is proof that he's powerful enough to do that. Let's join in this conversation and, and, and take this as, as him writing to us here today. Hey, look at that. I had all those up there. <laughs> Christians are without excuse. Salvation by faith alone. Sin is always, always met by grace. So with the view of the cross, let's jump into this. Romans 6, 1 through 4, first of all. What shall we say then? Are, to, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Okay, that's the cobra effect we're talking about. By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So he says, first of all, what shall we say then, Paul's asking? Because of all that we've just said, because of his grace that abounds more, what should our response be? By sinning more? Why would he ask that? His response is what? By no means. No way. I don't know, maybe the message, you know, <laughs> puts it a whole different way. Are you, are you kidding me? <laughs> are you serious right now? 
It could be translated in all kinds of different ways, but, but why would this be a response for us? Maybe it's just because we think that grace is regarding the act of sin only. Maybe we have yet to truly understand and personalize his love for us. Maybe we see it as something that allows him to kind of ignore sin or look over it so that we don't have to deal with it. (laughs) Rather, God's grace is more than forgiveness of the acts of sin we commit. We're looking at a grace that pertains to your whole person, your weaknesses, your, your sinful tendencies, your talents, your personality, all the good, bad, and ugly that comes with you and me. He sees and knows it all. You see, we are no longer slaves, but sons and daughters. And since we are sons and daughters, we are heirs through God. Grace says this, you are new creations in Christ. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. We're talking about a, an identity. You are no longer slaves. You are sons and daughters. <laughs> you are part of him. You are new creations. So the first result of grace, the intended result here, is this. You have a new kind of walk. It's a brand new way to walk. These first four verses phrase our freedom in terms of what we're freed from, right? Again, our freedom isn't that we can sin. In fact, verse 15 of the same chapter, if you you have your Bibles, you can just cruise down there for a second. Uh, Romans 6.15 says, Are we to sin because we are no longer under law but under grace? Again, by no means. This freedom... (laughs) <laughs> just like a nation that's been liberated. Uh, I heard from a missionary. You guys heard from a missionary this morning, and uh, you guys support missionaries I see all over the world. They're in contexts where they've been freed from an evil regime, or they would like to be freed <laughs> from an evil regime. That's the type of freedom we're talking about. It's a whole new world, or an individual who's gone through detox or is on the other side of addiction, it's a whole new world, isn't it? It's a whole new way of looking at things. It's a whole new life. You have a new authority. You have a new means of enjoying life. What you thought was enjoyment is changed. It becomes a long obedience to God in one direction, as opposed to the momentary pleasures that sin gives us that are, quite frankly, decreasing as they get along, are they not? That's why we want more and more of sin, not less and less when we get into it. Another example may be if you've ever had a medical concern that required you to change your lifestyle or your, or your diet, right? Uh, recently, I, I've had a little bit of a medical concern, uh, and I've had to change my sodium intake, for instance. Man, do you know how much sodium we eat if we don't watch it, right? Uh, and so when we go out to eat or something, right, I'm looking at the nutrition levels. I'm like, okay, uh, give me a burger, no bun, no cheese, um, lettuce and tomato. That'll be good. <laughs> good to go. And don't put salt on the fries, right? Uh, it's a new way of, of, of walking. This new lifestyle, this newness of life must include, by the way, a constant recalibration of our reality of sin. That's what the church body is for. Uh, That's what communion is meant for, uh, to bring us before our need for a Savior. And so I encourage you, as you you participate in communion together as a church body, as you you have your quiet time with the Lord, use that time to say, Lord, what do I need to eradicate out of my life? What am I not making sure of in my life. That's the new life, recalibrating our behavior according to God's standards, not just getting along and and asking forgiveness and going back to old patterns. That's the grace we're talking about.
recalibration. And so we go to verses 5 through 9 then. Uh, what's, what's the second result of grace, the intended result? We've alluded to it a little bit. Remember, being set free from sin, it's not being free to sin. You understand the difference? I, I've interacted with many Christians over the years who have, who have focused on the second part of that. They've said, uh, they said, hey, you know what? It do really doesn't matter. Uh, you know, we're, we're free to do what we want, and, and they've allowed that freedom to grab a hold of their life, and so that sin takes control as opposed to God's grace taking control. So let's look at verses 5 through 9 now, all right, as he continues with this. So newness of life, right? Intended result, newness of life, a new walk. Let's check out the second one. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his new life. We know that our old self was crucified with him. That's some strong language. Our old self, our old way of doing things crucified, literally pierced, literally nailed, all right? Paul uses this often. Our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. What does it say there? Brought to what? Nothing. This body of sin, what our flesh desires apart from Christ, that's the goal of grace. Oh, Lord, may I not be driven by this anymore. He goes on. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. So if we've died with Christ, we've been raised with Christ, and this, that applies to us as well, that death no longer has dominion over us. Eight times in those five verses, eight times he describes finality of one's death with Christ. Sin, all right, let's, sin, all right, let's, that word, that um, condition, it's horrible, it's a destructive habit, it's meant to bring harm, it's a disobedience to God. This sin is now disarmed through God's grace and no longer has a grip on us. We are set free from sin. The old self has died with Christ so that, in order that, sin might be brought to nothing. Only God knows the sin or sins that cripple you. Some of you this morning can name them right now. God only you know about this part of my life. It's destroying relationships. It's keeping you from the Lord. <laughs> In fact, I know what that feels like. You know that S on the chest of Superman? <laughs> Superman, invincible, right? Bullets bounce off of his chest, so to speak. You know, sometimes we think of sin in that way. I have this sin in my life, and I, I was determined to bring my secret sin to the grave with me, to be honest. Nobody knew until I was 32 years old. Nobody knew. Praise God, he forced the issue. Are you struggling with unwanted sin in your life right now? I've got some great news for you. That's a good struggle. Your struggle is real. It's also a testimony to the fact that your new nature is wanting to reject it, like someone going through detox, right? That their body is craving this drug that they've been used to. We talk about pornography in that way because, uh, because the research says it's the same dopamine, it's the same thing that's going on in a person's brain. That's why people get addicted to that. But no longer is your mind or your body craving that. 
but you're changing your habits and you're wanting to do the right thing. You're wanting to eat the right foods or you're wanting to uh, view the right things. Your body's going to be rejecting that and so there's going to be this struggle. But here we're talking about the difference between making excuses for our sin. Otherwise, otherwise known as... I don't know, I don't think I have that illustration up there, but I want you to think of a cage, just a, a cage, however you envision a cage. Right? Sometimes we, we put sin in there. <laughs> we want to just cage it for a while. We just want to, no, I don't want to, I hate that, I hate doing that, I hate that I always go back to that, but I'm going to cage it. Well, after a while, we, we know where the key is. <laughs> we know how to open it up at a convenient time. No. The difference is between that and having the idea of eradicating it or killing it. What's your mindset with your sin in your life? Are you wanting to cage it and just control it? Or do you want to, by the grace of God, kill it, get it out of there? Because that's the goal, that's the, that's the aim, that's the possibility. There's many testimonies. I heard two uh, yesterday from guys. Uh, mine is one as well. I've heard loads of testimonies of guys who've put this in the past. So what is sin's kryptonite then? What, did it, what, what is it exactly, Paul? Let's get, down to, uh, let's get down to really application here. Yeah, we understand this is death to sin, and uh, the result of grace is this, and, and, and there's a viewpoint difference that I have to have. A key word in this kryptonite is secret. Your secrecy only gives your sin that much more fertilizer to grow, <laughs> all right? It's just sprinkling fertilizer on your sin. Our secrecy with our sin is, is really Satan's playground. He messes with our mind. He tells us lies. He tells us it's okay. He gives us all the justification to go on with it. That's why even in the Old Testament, God wants us to know that he knows our frame. I got my tiny Bible up here because my other one is huge and falling apart, and so I got to find a happy medium at some point here. But, okay, bear with me. Psalm 103, um, there we go, verse 14, actually verse, we'll go back to verse 13. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. The verse before that even, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. And then verse 14, for he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. He knows, he understands our struggles, our, our mortality, our tendencies. He knows it. And then in Psalm, nine, or Psalm 90, verse 8, boy, uh, I mean, the whole chapter is awesome, but let me just take these, this verse. God does this. Ready? This is a, a prayer to God. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins, in the light of your presence. God has set our secret sins in the light of his presence. What's the kryptonite here? The light of Jesus. Oh, Jesus sheds light on our sin, shows it for what it is, and cleanses us through our confession and repentance. Cleanses us of that sin. Walk in the light by grace. That's what we're talking about here. Walking in the light by grace. I'm just going to close with um, a couple of verses here, including the last two of our passage, Romans 6, the last two verses. But this is how we're going to close. We're going to close by by just really diving into this, walking in the light of Jesus by grace. 
Three passages that will drive this home. Not some cobra effect, (laughs) where we found a loophole in God's grace, but walking in newness of life, eradicating sin from our life. The first one is is 1 John 1, 7. This is kind of a key verse for us as a ministry. I think I have it up there. I do. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That word cleanse at the end there, that's a present tense actually. So it could be read, and the blood of Jesus is continuing to cleanse us from all sin. As a believer in Jesus Christ, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior this morning, uh, that phrase maybe is, is, is familiar to you, but you don't know what it means, and you don't feel like, you know what, I, I don't know if that applies to me. That's not what we're talking about here. That is a case where we say, God, I'm a sinner. I cannot see you on my own. I cannot get to heaven on my own. I know that Jesus died in my place on the cross so that I may have life eternal. And it's coming to God with that confession and saying, I confess, I repent of my sins, and I believe on you, Lord Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. (laughs) Anybody can do that at any time of day. We'd love for you to talk to somebody this morning. We'd love for you to just to do that right now in your heart. This is his ongoing grace and presence right here. As we walk in the light, as we confess our sins to one another and have fellowship with one another, he continues to cleanse us from all sin. Just because you've been forgiven from your sin, does that mean that all the consequences are gone? No. When I confessed to my wife 24 years ago, well, I was forced to confess to her, but I did. Praise God, she confronted me, and I, I just, there was, the first time I told anybody anything, a dump truck load of crap <laughs> onto my wife that now she had to deal with. Were the consequences of my sin done? No. No. Over the last 24 years, he has been cleansing me from all that sin, cleansing my wife from all of my sin against her. It's an ongoing process. Only by naming it, acknowledging it, and confessing it to God and to someone else will the full power of God's grace be seen. That's sin's kryptonite right there. Ongoing obedience in confession and belief. So what's actually going on inside of those who do repent and believe? This is what's going on inside the last two verses of our passage. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God, speaking of Christ. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. We can leave this time. Jesus is enough. Thankful for the worship team. I'd I'd requested that they do that song, the song you heard at the very beginning. It's a new song. We're going to sing it at the end here, I believe. I appreciate them doing that. But I want you to take that in. Jesus, you are enough. This is me. I consider myself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Do you believe that by faith this morning? Kenneth Wiest, a commentator, put it this way on this passage. Our Lord's death not only paid the penalty of human sin, but it was used of God to break the power of the indwelling sin in the believer's life. If sin still has power over you, confession and repentance is not just for new believers. (laughs) It's for you and me. Just like Jesus asked the lame man if he wanted to get well. If you're familiar with that story, it's, I've been bewildered by that. Why would he ask someone, ask someone if they want to get well? But there's a reason. Are you really okay with that lifestyle? Are you really okay with that sin? Are you still a little bit enamored by it, maybe? God's asking you. God's asking me. Today, if you really want to get rid of the sin that so easily gets in the way of your walk with God, gets in the way of a productive life, of your, of your marriage, of your relationships, of your schooling, 
Is it taking away joy and peace, the ability to love others with the love of Christ? Or do you still have a place in your heart for that sin, keeping it a secret, not dealing with it, and just keeping it in a cage? God's grace is meant to free you from that, but only through our daily confession like we see in Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Lord, see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting.